Okay, so today it is the birthday of uh, Luis Isador Khan. He was born in 1901 in Estonia and uh, he immigrated with his parents at an early age. I think he was five years old when, when they immigrated to, to the United States. They were very poor. Uh, uh, and uh, besides this, Khan at a very early age, I don't know exactly, two, three years old, or something like this, he had a terrible accident. Um, uh, he burned his face terribly. And his, his mother, and in fact, he remained scarred all his life. Uh, and his mother said that, um, you know, this was almost like a sign from, from fate that, that her son would become someone great. And, and, and he did become, but I'm sure he struggled and uh, maybe this this is uh, something that differentiates him from 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 other architects well of course there are other architects who struggled and struggle and will struggle he was not the only one he is not the only one and he will not be the only one but we know of him and also because of this accident which which disfigured him um, you know he became kind of singular but what truly differentiates him from, from, from most other architects is the, 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 the character, the spirit of his work, the, the, the intensity, the, the ability to marry the past with the present and with what we, we might call the future. As, uh, as Vincent Scully, his friend, a professor at Yale and an important uh, historian and theoretician said, in the case of Louis Kahn, uh, the light of a candle uh, coexists with the light of a, a laser. So there is a candle light and there is a laser light, meaning there is the most remote past, ancient almost, and, uh, and, uh, and, and the most uh, visionary or new uh, kind of light, which, which Vincent, Vincent Scully uh, um, symbolized through the la laser light. Uh, I, I, I begin with this image, which is the ceiling of the Exeter Library, because I, to put this simply, I like it very much, because it is in a way kind of a, 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 a quintessential image for his work. There is centrality, but there is also the rotation of the diagonals. So there is the rebelliousness of the rotation. There is the periphery and there is the center. The periphery is, uh, you know, uh, the, the sides with wooden uh, parapets, uh, and, and 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 then the, the center is 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 uh, coagulated, is uh, is crystallized by uh, by the concrete uh, structural part of the of the of the core of the building. Anyway, so Luis Isador Khan, uh, you see, his name was. Uh, he was born Itzelaib Shmuilovsky on March 5th, but in, old, in the old uh, calendar was actually February 20th, and he died on March 17th in 1974. So he died um, 12 days after his birthday in 1974. Was an American architect now, I don't know very well about this, you know. I mean, yes, he was an American citizen. Yes, he was formed. He grew up in the United States, but he was born in Estonia. So maybe it should have meant, uh, it should have been uh, uh, present, the word Estonia there too. Anyway, <laughs> an American architect based in Philadelphia after working in various capacities for several firms in Philadelphia, he founded his own atelier in 1935. While continuing his private practice, he served as a design critic and professor of architecture at Yale School of Architecture from 1947 to 1957, so for 10 years. From 1957 until his death, he was a professor of architecture at the School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Khan created a style that was, uh, by the way, um, Venturi was one of his students. Khan created, and so was Jurgola. Khan created a style that was monumental and monolithic. His heavy buildings, for the most part, do not hide their weight, their materials, or the way they are assembled. 
famous for his meticulously built works, his provocative proposals that remained unbuilt, and his teaching, Kahn was one of the most influential architects of the 20th century. He was awarded the AIA gold medal, medal and, the, and the RIBA gold medal. At the time of his death, he was considered by some as, I quote, America's foremost living architect. Here he is, the foremost living architect. Uh, and he's still living. I mean, come on, we are talking about him exactly because he's still living. His architecture is, is, is with us and his ideas are with us. Um, I like this picture very much. And uh, when I show it, I, I comment it in this way because, you know, here we see two people, right? One of his employees there, you know, <laughs> laboring at, at the one drawing and then uh, the master himself, like a child hiding you know, with his left arm, or what he was scribbling on, or uh, and you you can see that he is kind of child, like a child who is doing maybe something uh, mischievous there, or uh, I, I don't know. Uh, look at those papers thrown on the on the drafting board and so on. So yeah, he he was an architect, obviously, and he deserved uh, to be called an architect. Uh, here he is. Um, as you can see, you, you can notice the scars on his face, but I think, I still think, you know, uh, and of course I am maybe carried away by my uh, sympathy towards him, but uh, I think he was a handsome man, although some might think that he was not, but I think uh, women uh, would agree with me because uh, two of them fell in love with him uh, so much that they became the mothers of his children. Um, but he was not a good father, I think for them and, but, what can we do? Life is, uh, is difficult for, for most of us. Um, I like his telephone. I, I love that kind of telephone. I wish I had that kind of telephone, not a mobile phone. I hate mobile phones. I really do. Anyway, but on that kind of phone, you cannot receive an SMS. That's the problem. And today, if you don't receive an SMS, you, it's like you don't exist. Okay, here he is with his with a parallelism, the intransigent parallelism of his hands showing clearly uh, uh, an, an, an intentional, uh, uh, you know, aspiration for, for the beyond in a way, even if here we are talking about the horizontal beyond. Uh, anyway, uh, here is a picture of him uh, contemplating his own work, the ceiling and the, the yell. Uh, art gallery, one of his earliest works. Again, Mr. Khan, hello, Mr. Khan, happy birthday to you. Look at, look at the expression of his face. I mean, this is a man who made it, right? I mean, he knows it. He knows he made it. He, he won the bet with life. And uh, yeah, he, he, try, he died in a way tragically. He made mistakes, he was a human. Uh, like all of us, he made mistakes, but he made it. You can tell from his face that he made it. He won the battle with life, with art, with um, you know the, 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 the difficulties of, of, of being a, a poor immigrant and so on. Here he is with his friend, Carlos Scarpa, Scarpa with his peculiar eyeglasses. Um, on the right, of course, is Scarpa. I didn't know Scarpa was so tall. I mean, taller than Kant. Bambu Dambu. Pardon? Bambu Dambu. Please be kind and turn off the microphone. If you respect what I'm trying to do here, please turn off the microphone because, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm talking freely and I have to be very, very attentive with what I say. So I don't say too many foolish things. Thank you. Um, Okay, here he is drawing with, with two, two hands, like Paul Klee and maybe even like uh, Leonardo, but I never saw pictures of Leonardo and Paul Klee doing it, uh, but I see one with, uh, with Louis Kahn here. Uh, and we cannot avoid this subject, Louis Kahn and his women. So the reason I say we cannot because, because the peculiarity of, 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 of what happened in his life and you probably know. So a picture now with Esther Khan, his wife. Uh, I, it amuses me sometimes when I download uh, or I, I paste a picture and it is at a, you know, a bigger resolution and it shows a fragment of the picture. I leave the first, the first one just as it is. So 
Now we see just the shoes, the shoes of, of Esther on the left, of course, and one shoe, not very clearly, of the great architect. And here is the whole picture. He does look like a seducer, very sure of himself. He was young, looking forward. He didn't know at that time that, that one day will we'll, we'll, we'll pay homage to him on his birthday in the year 2021. But this is exactly what is happening at this very moment. Hello, Esther. Hello, Louis. Now with Ann Ting. Ann Ting was a young uh, architect in his office, about 20 years younger than him. They fell in love. And the architect, although he was an Orthodox Jew, uh, he, he indulged himself into the affair. And they had a child together, a girl, uh, with whom actually I had the chance to talk on the phone one day. Uh, I will uh, maybe tell you the story some other time. Um, so here it is. I mean, here they are. And Ting on the left and the architect again, <laughs> Uh, rather cocky a little bit, uh, as many architects are uh, on, on, on the right. Um, it must be nice, you know, to be the boss in an office where, you know, you can employ whoever you want and uh, you are successful and you build and you know your value. And then, of course, the sky is the limit, both romantically and professionally. Here they are again, hunting, and you are going to see a work done by both. and. And, and the experts think that is mostly her work, not his. Although we know of it mainly because of the man behind the glass of wine, if that's what it was there. Anyway, Anting on the right, Louis Kahn on the left. Uh, with Harriet Patterson, another young architect, but this time a landscape architect who worked with him and for him, and they fell in love after the so-called affair with Anting ended. And she also gave birth uh, to, to a child to him, that is the film director, uh, the young man who made that film, very well-known film, uh, my, my Architect, about Louis Kahn. Uh, it was a book published by Harriet Pat Pattison, a memoir with letters from Louis Kahn. At least that's what she got, you know, this, uh, this book published because um, Khan didn't marry her, although he promised that, that he will do so. Here they are. Uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I look at this picture and I smile because I don't know. It, it, it's so strange in a way, you know. I mean, look at him. He's, he's enjoying himself, but, but, but this was a married man. <laughs> who had a wife at home uh, and a daughter also at home. And, uh, and he is in the grass here, you no know, splendor in the grass. And sometimes I think that actually uh, uh, God loves sinners because, you know, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what to say, you know, is in a way, no one is actually punishing uh, someone for falling in love, uh, so-called, uh, you know, uh, outside of the of the frames of the uh, you know uh, of the marriage, but architects in general are known for uh, for being lovers of life. Let's put it this way, and um, they indulge. There was even an architect who died because of his indulging in in the in the in the in the in the joys of life. A famous architect from a kid made and white, Mr. White. He was assassinated by the by the the husband of, uh, of one of the ladies he uh, he was able to seduce anyway moving forward so these were the three you know important women although i read a story that uh, actually venturi the, the you know uh, robert venturi the, the the author of um, the complexity and contradiction and in, in architecture and uh, you know learning from las vegas um, he <laughs> He himself also lost his girlfriend to, to Mr. Louis Kahn. I understood that he introduced uh, his girlfriend to Louis Kahn and uh, after a while, uh, you know, his girlfriend left him for, uh, for Louis. So Louis was irresist irresistible, wasn't he? Anyway, let's move forward. Ske sketches, drawings. He drew a lot and I think he drew beautifully most of the time. I mean, his sketches, you know, I mentioned uh, Bjarke Ingels, in my opinion, 
uh, you know, in terms of drawing, Khan was far superior to someone like, but again, this says something about our time. We love cartoons. We are superficial in the present. We don't like any longer, you know, master drawings a la Bernini or Michelangelo or even Alvaralto and, and certainly not Khan. We know the drawings of Ingels, right? They are cartoon-like, that's how they are. They, they don't show great sensitivity. Yes, they are quickly done. He's a versatile uh, draftsperson, but, but, but artistically, they don't have the intrinsic quality that the drawings of, let's say, in this case, uh, Khan have. And uh, again, this says something about our time. Uh, not all his drawings, like this one, personally, I don't like so much, but apparently it was this book was published called Louis Kahn, The Importance of a Drawing. And there are countless drawings by him. <clears throat> and I read uh, that <clears throat> after his death, because his wife Esther, um, uh, received from him the, 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 you know, after his death, she was, she was obliged to, to produce money because he was bankrupt. Louis Kahn was bankrupt when he died. One of the most famous architects of his time, if not the most famous, he, he died bankrupt. And uh, so she had to sell the furniture of his office and drawings by him. And I understood that, uh, um, I read in a newspaper in the States that, uh, you know, towards the end of his life, people began to steal the, the sketches. He used to sign, uh, sign his sketches and, uh, you know, they, they used to steal some of the drawings because Louis would come back to the office the next day in the morning and then not find his sketches. Well, <laughs> this is the price you pay sometimes when you are famous. Uh, this is a drawing for the Bryn Mawr College, and you, we are going to talk about him. I mean, he drew on yellow tracing paper quite nicely, and you can see these, these, these so-called unclear areas which show attention as if he was not uh, happy. Maybe he worked with ch charcoal and, and pastel, and, and, and I know he also did pa uh, pastel drawings. He worked with pencil, with but, but his drawings, I think, do have an emotional uh, and artistic quality. This is a plan of, for a monastery which was not built, but the plan looks very interesting, I think, and I regret it was not built. I have a section in this presentation which I didn't have in February with unbuilt works. And you will see three unbuilt works that, that were excellent, but they were not built. Um, a cross section, a, a section through the, the, the Kimball Museum in Texas. Again, a fragment of Bryn Mawr. The studies for the, uh, I, I imagine, you know, is that I see towers here, like in the Richards Laboratories. We arrive there. Uh, there is a book which I actually have the paintings and sketches of Louis Kahn. Louis I. Kahn. Louis Isadore Kahn. Uh, yes, he drew a lot. You saw that one uh, already. This is probably, uh, this might be actually for the Salk Institute. And, and you see in this sketch, there are some trees or something in between the two rows of buildings. It was Louis Barragan who told him not to use any vegetation. And he, he listened to the advice of his friend. And, uh, and, and I think it was a good thing he listened to uh, Barragan no vegetation at all in between the two rows of buildings. This is a, 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 a not a, an excellent uh, drawing of, of a tower that he did together with Anting. We are going to see it in detail, uh, a study for, I don't know what this is. Um, this one also, I don't know, I think it's for a synagogue in Philadelphia. Uh, and uh, yeah. I think he drew very well, uh, not every, every time, but, but still, I think his, his drawings show us a level of genuineness. Uh, they, these are some sketches he did for, you, could, you would call these uh, visionary you know, buildings. Uh, they were not built, of course, but he had for Philadelphia a, a, a very developed uh, plan um, which was was rejected in the end, but uh, it, it would have it would have meant a lot for Philadelphia if it was implemented, but it was not. Anyway, 
drawings, drawings, the architect drawing. This is part of the plan for Philadelphia. And this is a self-portrait and it moves me this image, you know, you see on the right, uh, you know, a fragment of the face of, of the architect and on the left, you see the drawing and, you know, what is the relationship between an artwork and life, between life and death, you know, the, now both stare at us, you know, both of them stare at us, but he's gone, he's dead. Well, we talk about him, we wish him happy birthday, but he is not with us any longer. So again, what is the relationship between left art, right life, but now both art and life stare at us from, from the beyond that uh, death means. Anyway, uh, shadows and light, he was very fond of, of shadows. Here uh, we see a sketch for uh, studies, a study for uh, Richard's laboratories. I like this drawing, it's very, as you can see, it's, it's very uh, almost cryptical, it's abstract. It's, uh, it's this tension, graphic tension between light and shadow. Uh, and um, yeah, study trips. Uh, he had a chance to be for a year a fellow at the Academy uh, of Art in Rome, uh, the American Academy in Rome, and uh, then he, 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 he traveled from the, some other places, Egypt, also uh, Siena, you see Egypt. Uh, I'm sure this trip had a great, great impact on him, and, and it changed him, actually, because he returned to the States a different man, a different architect. Because until then he, he had a practice and you see a few works he did early in his career, you know, modernistic, early modernism, you know, skillfully done, but nothing to announce what we know today by Louis Kahn. Uh, Pestum here, whom he loved, he loved Pestum. In fact, he even said that the Hera's temple in Pestum, that there are actually two temples, uh, is more important to him than the Parthenon. And I understand why, because I, I, had, I had visited this temple myself and the power of those pre-Doric columns is almost unbearable. And, and uh, Piranesi loved, loved it, Goethe loved it, Winkelmann loved it, Kahn loved it. It's something about Pestum, Pestum which is magical. You truly feel the telluric power of the earth, the, the, the force of the earth, the, the, the importance, the gravity of, of gravity if I can say so. And uh, I, I read and I keep repeating this, but maybe, maybe there is some truth in this, that infertile couples, when they go to Pestum and spend the night there, they become fertile. It is something magical. And this is a drawing from Pestum by Louis Kahn. Um, Siena, Imhotep's pyramid, the first pyramid, the stepped pyramid by Imhotep for King Zoser, Egypt, of course. Um, and uh, back to Europe and back to ruins. He loved ruins. He, he, he wrote about ruins and the ruins are present in various forms, transfigured in, 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 in some very important works by him from uh, uh, the Kimball Museum to even uh, the Exeter Library where I just read that uh, apparently there is a ruin within a ruin within a ruin, like three layers of ruins they don't appear to be ruins, but he had in mind, obviously, the, his, his very, very fruitful trip to Europe. Early works. Uh, the Mill Creek project in Philadelphia, a housing project. He, he was doing, uh, you know, social housing, social housing. Uh, some of these were destroyed. Uh, some still exist. They are still the works of Louis Kahn. You see, he built a lot. Uh, you see here the, the, the site plan. I don't know he built all of them, but, but he built uh, quite a number of them. He built this tower. He built this row of buildings. Uh, but, but at that time, he was not Louis Kahn. He just had a, you know, a small practice. Uh, these, these still exist, I think, I think and I hope. Um, you know, these, these were built for, for, for uh, underprivileged people. You know, they were, they were social housing. Uh, 
but you can still see the, the quality of, of architecture, even if it is done with simple means. Uh, yes, and uh, I keep saying this, that I think the stars of today should build for the poor as well and show their greatness at this level of dedication to those who are less privileged as well. But what, with all due respect and uh, even admiration, what did Zaha Hadid do? She worked for uh, the elite. What does Rem Kolhas do? He works for the elite, for Prada. You know, he talks now about the, the, the great value of, 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 the, of the village, of, of the rurality. But what does rurality have to do with Prada? Nothing. So the mundanity of the, by the way of this, at one point, Louis Kahn was asked, um, uh, maybe in an interview, what do you think of the New York Five? You know, the, the New York Whites, those five architects, John Haydock, Peter Eisenman, Charles Guidme, Michael Graves, and Richard Meyer. And he called them playboy architects. And he said, I prefer to do what is right in the wrong way than to do what is wrong in the right way. Now, yes, it is a touch of moralism here. And when we contemplate his uh, personal life, you, we wonder a little bit. But uh, in this case, he was referring, of course, to architecture, not to personal uh, uh, you know, uh, deviations from uh, righteousness. OK, this is the site plan of, again, I don't know if he built a lot, but uh, I mean, everything. But he beat about a number of buildings. Uh, but even here, you see, even if he used uh, the grid and re rectangularity, but there is a level of playfulness and uh, a variety uh, here in this site plan. The Coward Shoes Company in Philadelphia, this is the building. And uh, it took courage, of course, to build near this building something like this. And I think he's not bad at all. Arne Jacobson, the, the Dane, would have been quite happy, I think, with, with this building. Uh, and even today, if you build something like this, I think it would, it would make it to the pages of Arch Daily and other sites. Maybe less the cars, although I love vintage cars. I don't love, I, I'm not, I'm, I, I don't have a great knowledge about cars. I don't even have a driving license. I only drove one year in New York without a driving license. I had an accident and uh, then I forgot to put um, uh, oil in, in, in the motor and then I, I killed the car and that was it. But, but I like, you know, it's nostalgia, of course, because these cars were as uh, vicious, if not more vicious in, in polluting the air. But if you look at the building and you look at the contemporary car, you see clearly the power of art to transcend chronos, to transcend chronology, not the cars, but the art, in this case, the building by Khan, yes. Uh, the, from 1951, so he was 50 years old. Khan was really not, a, um, a, I mean, he, he was not a uh, young enfant terrible. He, he, he started late. In fact, he became, he started to become famous at 55, not at 25 like these days or 35, 55. So he was 50, 50 years old when he built the, the Yale uh, University Art Gallery. And you already saw a picture with a ceiling. Uh, this one, you, you saw this one. And uh, <laughs> I almost felt like saying the art, young architect is looking uh, you know, with a certain kind of, of pride towards the ceiling of, of, of his work. But the so-called young architect was 50 years old at that time. Uh, anyway, this is the, the, the gallery. And you see, it, it is structure, right? It, it is structure. It is more, mostly structure. It is simple. And yet there is complexity here. You know, this art gallery already shows skill, already shows uh, a, a, a true architect at work. Uh, and uh, what else can we say? See, he was 50 years old uh, and he designed uh, this art gallery in, uh, with a simple architectural language, but it's not simplistic. And of course, the, the ceiling has uh, its importance here. 
it is regular, it is, uh, you know, uh, in a way predictable, and yet not quite because of the diagonals and the, 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 the cassettes, the, the, it's this fragmentation of the whole ceiling, it is coherent, there is multiplicity in unity. I, I think he did a good job. Uh, and uh, you see the importance of a ceiling. In fact, if there is anything interesting, here is the ceiling, nothing else. And yet, as a whole, is a, is a very convincing uh, art gallery. Uh, that's, that's not everything that he did there. Also, the staircase is, is remarkable, uh, enclosed in a, in a cylinder. Uh, and he did this uh, a few times. He, he loved to punctuate rectangular spaces with a, with a, with a cylinder, with a sculptural sculptural ceiling there he allows he did this also at the uh, British Museum in, in Yale, at Yale um, uh, we are going to see that work so this was it, it, uh, here this is 1953 I guess it when the building was uh, opened uh, was built but he began the design in 1951 in 1953 he was already 52 years old um, and look at the at the ceiling plan it's perfect, no? I mean, aesthetically, it's, it's, uh, it's pleasant to look at. You could make an engraving of this or, or just hang a picture on the wall just with this drawing. It's, it, it's sensitive, it's, it's, it has complexity, it has simplicity, it's, it's, it's fine. Uh, and this is how the building looked uh, from the outside, a little bit similar to that um, um, store that we saw in Philadelphia in terms of aesthetics. Again, the, the uh, triangular uh, staircase uh, within the cylinder. Here we could think a little bit of Tadao Ando. Yes, we could. Um, I, I imagine that uh, Ando knew uh, about the work of Luis Kahn and certainly Mario Bota knew. In, in the case of Mario Bota, all too obviously. Anyway, this picture is, is beautiful, I think. This black and white picture of this you know, enclosed staircase within a cylinder, but it's very mysterious and complex. And and look at the look at look at this. This connects with the ceiling, right? I mean, you know, this is the parapet of this stair, uh, and but it, it has the same uh, ornamentation, structural ornamentation, if I can call it so, that the ceiling has. Uh, this is the front uh, elevation. Now, the, this is the project he built, he did together with Anne Ting, uh, the, young, the younger woman that he fell in love with. And the, I think it would have been great if it was built, but it was not built. But who knows, maybe one day, someone with the resources would say, let's build, although these days maybe we shouldn't uh, be carried away about building too many towers, I think, but, but this tower, was, was exceptional and it's so sad it was not built. So first, let's see the two of them, Louis Kahn and Anne Ting, the authors of this project. You see them here and maybe this was the, the maybe his Estonian friend, uh, a brilliant engineer and we are going to arrive at, he, at him. Um, so um, here it is, uh, here she is, hunting um, in, in her um, older age uh, with a tower, with a fragment of the tower that she worked with Louis Kahn on. But, but the, the experts think that her impact on this tower, because this was not really how Kahn worked, this, the, her impact on this project was, was, uh, was very important. And here she is uh, making a presentation I think about this um, this tower. You see it in the background, and some uh, structural, uh, you know, acrobatics here that apparently she was uh, very knowledgeable about and interested in. Uh, and here she is um, again with the, with the can on the left, and I don't know who is on the right. I don't know what they are doing there. Anyway, but here we see on the left Louis Kant wanting the Rome letters. And <laughs> I mean, you know, both women published books, uh, you know, it was some kind of a, not revenge, but, you know, establishing some kind of justice. So they, they published books 
with the, with the letters, with the love letters that Louis Kahn wrote to them. You know, this, 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 this father of, of their children who, who, who didn't acknowledge them. Louis Kahn didn't acknowledge having a daughter with Anting and a son with Harriet Pattison. And this is terrible. Uh, I mean, these women sacrifice their lives for the smiling architect on the right. And uh, this could be the subject of a possible discussion, I think, because uh, I don't know, it, it, it was a strange case. And no one knew until he died that he had two children outside of his marriage. No one knew, but uh, afterwards they did learn. This was the tower, and I think it would have been very, very nice if it was built, but it was not built. And uh, indeed, the kind of architecture uh, that we look at is a little bit different from the so-called typical, if we can use such a word, typical Louis Kahn architecture. Although Kahn is here too, but I think there is also a lot from Anting. Um, Yes, I, I like this tower very much because it is a tower which uh, pendulates, if I can say so, between being and becoming. It also contains within processuality, there is process, as if the building is still in the process of becoming. And, and, and I like this very much. If we could somehow combine being with becoming, I think uh, uh, would have a very, very interesting architecture. Here he is probably with the Estonian architect we are going to arrive at uh, because he did two great works with him. The Philips, the, the, yes, the Richards Laboratories in Philadelphia and the um, uh, Kimball Museum in, uh, in, uh, in Texas. I, I, I like this picture very much. On the right, we see a, a brilliant uh, tower, you know, the project for a brilliant tower. On the left, we see an engineer a brilliant engineer and near him a brilliant architect and they both look at, at the work that would need both and i remember the sketch that uh, le corbusier did with uh, uh, the intertwining of an engineer's hand and an architect's hand that that the architect needs the engineer and the engineer needs the architect and if they collaborate properly then something beautiful could come into being Unfortunately, this tower didn't come into being, but who knows, who knows, maybe, maybe one day it might, because actually after the death of Louis Kahn, something was built post-mortem. After his death, uh, something was built and you are going to see what was built. And uh, it seems two other works, I, which I didn't yet see. So on the 17th of March, I will include those works in the presentation as well. Okay, so uh, this is the work she di he did uh, when he was in love with Anting. And yes, love could inspire one towards greatness. Uh, and uh, if, if your lover is also a very inspired architect, like in this case uh, uh, was, uh, Anting herself was a brilliant architect. Uh, interesting things happen. The Trenton Bath from 1954 to 1959, this is one of his uh, seminal works, uh, the early works, but a, a work that meant a lot for his evolution. It's a simple work, if we can call it so, but not simplistic. Uh, he already returned from Rome and, uh, he, he, you know, you see here a transformed Khan. He was still a modern architect, a modernist architect, but, but he brought something from Europe. Uh, he, I think he, he digested, if I can say so, very, very well the history of Europe. There is a, a seriousness here, a tectonic seriousness that, uh, uh, that, uh, that transcends, uh, you know, uh, simple formal or formalistic uh, uh, gestures. It's, it's an it's a inexpensive, uh, simple uh, building, you know, but, but it is architecture. And, you know, you could ask me, what do you mean? Well, I don't know, I could improvise now. I see the, the, the solid walls uh, in the lower part and then I, I see the, the roof which has integrity and it has a very nice structure, but almost floating above 
the 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 the, the solid walls. Uh, it, it, it's a balanced architecture. It is uh, uh, a fundamentalist in a way. I think we cannot talk about Louis Kahn without assuming a word like fundamentalism. Yes, he was he was very attracted by beginnings. He even said beginnings are in harmony with the human nature. Foundations, archaic, archetypal. Uh, so his architecture, yes, was 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 exploring that volume zero of history that he was searching for. He wanted to start from the very bottom, and in that sense, it is a fundamentalist architecture. In the tension between fashion and eternity, he uh, he didn't neglect at all what is called the eternity. Eternity. Maybe this is what irritated someone like Kolhas, because I don't think Kolhas thinks at all in terms of what this word might might mean. Is closer, I think, to fashion, to the circumstantial, to the uh, tra transitory and ephemeral. Although, although, because he is an important architect himself, he, I'm sure he didn't neglect what even uh, Frank Gehry acknowledged that it is important. Frank Gehry said, yes, it is important to build for your time and your place, but also uh, think about timelessness. In the case of Khan, I think uh, this uh, timelessness is even more present than in the case of uh, many other architects. So this is the Jewish bath in uh, Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, you see, the plan is, is is very simple, but 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 uh, there is a, a an alternate uh, uh, architectural uh, uh, presence here. Uh, you know, there are the little cubicles, solid, and then the open spaces. And uh, is it, this this uh, equilibrium between closed and open that uh, creates something that is. Uh, uh, it is balanced, but it is alive. It is not uh, uh, dogmatically, it's not frozen into an equilibrium. And look at the structure of the roof, it's, it's excellent. It's simple, it's functional, it's but, but still aesthetically pleasant. Now this is a rendering, a drawing by him. The plan otherwise is almost infuriatingly simple now, but, but it is a major work of art. Now, this is a work you are not going to see, but you are going to see it on the 17th of March, when I will pay homage to him again. Otherwise, you'll see most of the works that you see this um, little um, collage of... Uh, so, Trenton is here, an early work, 1953, 1955. It is usually uh, said that Khan became, Louis Khan became known on the international scene around 55. But you, we, you saw that uh, he built the Yale Art Gallery at fifth, between 51 and 50, being 53. Two years later, he already broke in, uh, you know, uh, spectacularly with the building of the Richards Laboratories, which will come next. But, but the Trenton is also very important. Uh, this is a more, uh, um, I mean, a more co not contemporary perhaps, but a, a picture closer to our time. Uh, and uh, yes, there is geometry. You know, in fact, it's so simple what we see, look at, but, but uh, it's not simplistic. It, it has the value of, of uh, seriously assumed, uh, a seriously assumed architectural program and served appropriately. Now we arrive at, at, at the word that actually launched him uh, uh, with, with uh, I almost said with vehemence on, on the international scene, the Richards Laboratories in Philadelphia, which I visited. Uh, Louis Kahn and Auguste Commandant, this is the engineer. And I, I think he was the one in that picture uh, where both were looking at the, at the at that tower that he he designed together with Anting, a few works about this remarkable engineer, August uh, August Commandant. He was also from Estonia, just like Louis Kahn was. So this is uh, <laughs> this is Kahn smoking or not? Maybe I don't know. Anyway, uh, maybe it's not a cigarette there. But this book, 
but it is maybe a cigarette. I don't know, whatever it is, a pencil or a cigarette. It's actually a well-known picture of Louis Kahn. But you see, this was a book published by this engineer, commandant, 18 years with architect Louis Kahn. For 18 years, they collaborated. What we look at here in the sketch is, a, is, a, is actually a work that was not built and I don't have it in this presentation, but maybe I should by, by the 17th of March. Commandant also was the engineer of this very famous work by Moshe Safdi in Montreal. This I found out just today when I incorporated this, uh, this, uh, uh, this image into the presentation. I didn't know he was the engineer of this famous work by Moshe Safdi in Montreal. Um, interesting. But he worked with other important uh, architects, this, this himself, very important engineer. And from what I understood, there were tensions between Kahn and him, especially at the Kimball Art Museum. And then uh, Commandant um, commented that, uh, uh, I mean, it was in, uh, sometimes a fight between two egos. Anyway, a few words about him. So he was born in 1906, so he was five years younger than uh, Louis Kahn, was an Estonian-American structural engineer whose collaboration with famous architects and engineers resulted in several 20th century architectural masterpieces. His professional career spanned more than half a century from the 1930s to 1980s and coincided with an era characterized by modernization, urbanization, and the rapid development of technology. This is the work they did together, uh, the Richards Laboratories. And uh, it is a very important work by, by Louis Kahn. Here he employed his famous uh, um, separation between spaces which serve and spaces which are served. Uh, and the, the servant spaces, so to speak, are the massive towers and the served spaces are the laboratories themselves, which are in between the massive towers, which were inspired by the towers, the feudal towers uh, in San Gimignano in Italy. Uh, and look at the structure. Indeed, I mean, I, I, I don't know a lot about uh, engineering, but uh, aesthetically, uh, it, it, it is uh, seducing what I see here. You know, I, I, I can feel that the engineering was also excellent. And uh, because, because it, it, it is uh, on one hand uh, um, honest, sincere, but on the other hand, it surprises you with, with its uh, unexpected aesthetics. Uh, and um, yes, the engineer needs the architect, the architect needs the engineer, and maybe not in this order. Maybe I should have said first, the architect needs the engineer. Uh, because, because the way the structure was done, uh, you know, it, it would have been here a chance or, or the lack of a chance actually uh, to, 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 be, to have a, a complex too rigid, too massive, too static. But between these massive towers, like, like uh, anchoring uh, entities, architectural entities, you had the fra fragilization of architecture that uh, brilliant arch uh, structure made possible. So is this, this uh, dialectic between uh, uh, stability and instability, between solidity and fragility? And Kahn himself was a dialectician. He worked with uh, dual forces or dual entities all the time. Uh, this is maybe a little bit uh, difficult to read, but you see the plan there. Uh, and in those towers, he had the, the, the technical spaces and, uh, you know, the, the like uh, toilets, bathrooms, uh, anything that would have disturbed perhaps the purity of the labs themselves, which he wanted them to be free of any kind of prosaic realities, so to speak. A uh, problem with this building is that when I visited it, uh, many windows were, were um, 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 blocked with, uh, with uh, aluminum foil because uh, there was glass and, uh, and I think the, the scientists, those using the labs, had difficulties in their laboratories because of too much solar light. Anyway, um, these are the towers of San Gimignano. 
that that uh, probably inspired um, uh, Louis Kahn, but he transformed them as opposed to the postmodern architects. He didn't just, uh, you know, literally copy some little things from here and there. No, his architecture is resolutely modern. It belongs to our time, even to our time, in, meaning even to 2021. And at the same time, there is a dialogue with his past illustrated in San Gimignano. Uh, verticality was always a sign of uh, individuality and maybe opulence and power and so on. Um, I see a line here, and this line will fatally remain now until the end of, 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 of the presentation. And I don't know how it showed up. Uh, I don't know what to do. This will ruin the presentation. Should I stop now the presentation and can, let me let me try this because it is a very uh, obvious line there, which I don't know how it showed up there. Uh, just a second, I have to. Uh, how do I do this? Yes, it's. Uh, okay, <clears throat> we continue our presentation. Um, so I said a few things already about the, 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 uh, this building and about the towers. We keep looking at, at, at this very important work in his oeuvre because he, he truly began in a way with the Richards Laboratory uh, or laboratories. Um, and we see the, 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 you know, the, the structure that it, a structure doesn't have to be hidden if it has somehow uh, uh, the power to, to, to convince one uh, also aesthetically, as this one does. And, and that's, this is what I feel, that, that, that somehow the engineer was able to, 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 to compensate or to balance the massivity of the towers with a structure that, that, that uh, became uh, more uh, open and, and fragile towards the corner of the building. And, and the corner is always uh, problematic in architecture. And that's why um, Frank Lloyd Wright advocated the corner windows and, uh, you know, Le Corbusier. So it, the, corner, the corner is the critical, uh, almost the, the, yeah, in a way, it's a, the critical part of the building. Uh, and it is also the most vulnerable, uh, because it, that's where two walls meet, and then the, the corner is, is, is I think, usually uh, the one that succumbs to the, the attack of the elements quicker than some other parts of the building. And here we see the, a, a model of the structure by Augustus uh, uh, Commandant. Okay, uh, and now we go to uh, a very strange building, which I didn't know of until today when I kept adding material to the, the presentation I already had. Uh, and I discovered this house that I knew nothing about. And I don't know, I, I like to think it's still alive from 1957. So it was made two years or so, uh, a little bit after uh, the Richards Laboratories. It's a private house. And uh, this looks like an abandoned building. In fact, I saw announcements saying, you know, a rare building by Louis Kahn for sale. It was probably not even expensive. Uh, yeah, it was, it, it was abandoned. This happens uh, often in the United States, you know, people move and sometimes they leave behind jewels like, like this building. I mean, you know, this building, knowing that it was made by Kahn should have been enough of a reason never to move, you know, but you know, economic reasons or whatever made people move and leave behind the, the building. My baby, maybe it was uh, sold at an auction, you know, by the state or something. This is a, a view from the top with a roof uh, either in construction or being demolished, or I, I don't know exactly what is happening here. But we have some pictures from the inside, and you can see that just, just the uh, I mean, the roof is as 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 uh, as, um, as well done as at the Trenton uh, uh, bath uh, complex. Uh, 
I mean, this building could have been restored beautifully. It's not because Khan had integrity also. He didn't, indeed, his architecture is considered meticulous because he was not a superficial player with forms. He loved forms, yes, but he, he never neglected the, 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 the act of, of building correctly uh, a building. And uh, you will see some, I mean, look, look, at the, look at the ceiling here. It's glorious. I mean, to have just just such a living room, you know, and, and to abandon the building. And I imagine it was abandoned. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a real Louis Kahn building. Now we arrive at a strange work. Uh, this work, why do I say it's strange? He did a planning for a much larger campus in the Midwest. I understood this was the only building built in the Midwest by Louis Kahn. Uh, unfortunately, the estimate was for about $25 million. And the building that you are going to see was built with approximately $2.5 million. The other buildings were not built. And in the end, when it was built, I think uh, the final um, touch, so to speak, or the grand opening of the building happened very close to the time of his death. Although the project was done in the 60s, you know, like 1964 or so, and he died in 1973. It was a disappointing affair. And I can tell, I, I feel for Khan, so to speak, because looking at the pictures of this work, uh, I, 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 it is as if it's not quite Louis Kahn. I don't know what happened. Maybe the, the beneficiary was difficult. Maybe they ran out of money. I don't know. Um, so let me read. In 1961, the architect Louis Kahn, this is a, a much less known work by him, but it is by Louis Kahn. So the architect Louis Kahn was commissioned by the Fine Arts Foundation to design and develop a large arts complex in central Fort Wayne, Indiana. The ambitious fine arts center now known as the arts, arts United Center would cater to the community of 800,000 uh, by providing space for an orchestra, theater, school, gallery, and much more. As a Lincoln Center in miniature, the developers had hoped to update and upgrade the city through new civic architecture. However, due to budget constraints, only a fraction of the overall scheme was completed. It is one of Kant's lesser known projects that spent over a decade and his only building in the Midwest. Kant's original proposal encompassed a philharmonic hall, art school, gallery, and civic theater bound together in a large complex. Yet troubles began early in the project as the architect's $20 million estimate dwarfed the expected $2.5 million cost of, the, of this particular building. I think I said $25 million, the, it's $20 million anyway, sorry. So from 1961 to 1964, while also completing the Richards Medical Labor Center at the University of Pennsylvania, which you just saw, Khan and his office worked as a, 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 a series of schemes uh, for the expensive project. A collection of plaster models held by MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, revealed Khan's intentions to arrive at a single entrance for all activities accessed either by foot or car. I think when all these activities come together, there is a kind of thing that is created, Khan said. They surely function in themselves but when they come together, there is something new. This interest in the relationally, uh, in the relationally, it should be relationally, uh, something is wrong in the text, in the, in the relationship of building or the relation between the building and the program would, like a majority of the project, bow to economics, but this didn't happen. So the mundane realities, I know it did happen. Yes, it bowed, it bowed to economics, the, the money won in, in, in the bad sense of the word, in, meaning it, 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 most buildings were not built. The mundane realities of parking meant Kant's intention 
for an elevated, an elevated parking tower as part of the complex would vanish in later study models. Yes, he, he had a problem with cars. He didn't like cars. Um, he didn't like cars that didn't move. Even for Philadelphia, he proposed massive structures. He said that a uh, car which moves is, 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 is OK, is acceptable. It should move. That's what it is made for. But he had problems seeing cars that didn't move, meaning parked, parked cars. This is the facade of the building, and the, this this facade is fine. This is indeed Louis Kahn, and is a powerful facade, and it is a mask. This is what it is. It is a theatrical mask. You can see the eyes, the nose, the mouth, so to speak, but it is a mask, almost a mask coming from other cultures, and appropriately so, because this was a theater. So symbolically and powerfully, Kahn uh, 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 um, creates here a narrative architecture without words, but you don't need the words to notice the mask. Unfortunately, the rest of the building is not as powerful as this facade. Uh, well, this sculpture, or whatever it is, doesn't belong to him. Uh, so the front elevation is fine, it's Louis Kahn. But, uh, and this space here also is fine, which is uh, related to the front elevation. But there are other parts which are less, uh, less convincing. Uh, I don't know what this is here, you know, a concrete part with, um, I don't know. Here, I, here I don't truly feel uh, the same uh, intensity uh, that I felt on the front elevation and the space just beneath, behind it. It's, I don't know, was it can here or not, or I don't know. And even here, it's, it's not, I mean, when he asked a brick, what do you want to be? And the brick said, I want to be an arch. Well, somehow this arch doesn't have the power to, to evoke what he said. In other cases, like in uh, Ahmedabad, I think, uh, and Dhaka is different. But here, I don't know. Or maybe this came later and it would have been different if it was opened. I don't know. Uh, this is interesting, but I don't know exactly what it is. Um, you know, some kind of a corridor. Anyway, he was dissatisfied with this work, and maybe that's why it is lesser known. But I think it's interesting to know even the lesser known works. Uh, and, uh, you know, even a great architect sometimes doesn't do very great works. It's, it's, it's almost unavoidable. Um, and plus, in this case, I think he, he didn't control everything. This is the plan. And yeah, it doesn't quite look like a Louis Kahn building. Uh, anyway, moving forward. The sections, yes, do have something of Kahn. Because Kahn uses, even at Exeter, he uses peripheral spaces. So there is a, 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 a structure within a structure an island within an island, a country within a country, so to speak, a ruin within a, a ruin. And so this has something of Khan, but uh, other things, uh, maybe even this, this longitudinal sections, they, they, they are okay, but I don't know, something is impure here. And I think uh, uh, Khan had reasons to be dissatisfied. Ultimately, the theater of performing arts was relatively disappointing for Khan as it represented only a shadow of the original plan and betrayed his vision for an architecture of interrelations. I like this very much, this expression, an architecture of interrelations. And maybe all great art in architecture or all great architecture is about that, about interrelations. And maybe not just in the field of art or architecture, but also in the field of human relations. No? Interrelations. What does that mean? It means connecting. As his friend Vincent Scully said, quoting from the British writer Froster, only connect. Uh, it's just this short quotation in an essay about, uh, about uh, his friend Khan. Vincent Scully uh, quoted uh, and, and said, only connect. 
And if we can achieve that connection between me and you, between a man and a woman, between, I don't know, a white so-called white man and so-called black man, between a so-called yellow man and a so-called black man, uh, between left and right, up and down, between, uh, uh, between all parts which are segregated, if we could somehow interrelate, we would have no more wars and we would have uh, uh, you know, a, a world which is in harmony, not necessarily a placid world or a bucolic world, no, a real world. But so this architecture of interrelations, he created such a, a, a space there between various buildings, interrelations, but because the other buildings were not built, there were no interrelations any longer. So form is that which deals with inseparable parts, said Kant inseparable parts. Again, this means parts which connect with the others. If you take one thing away, you don't have the whole thing. And nothing is ever really fully answerable to that which man wants to accept as part of his way of life, unless all its parts are together. As Joseph Rickward comments, it's hard to believe that the striking face on the facade was an accident. Instead, it remains a lasting testament to the negotiations and often frustrating realities of making architecture. Well, here I would add, as I already said, that I think that mask was a metaphor for the building itself, whose function was theater, performing art. So quite normally, a mask would be related to what was behind that wall. Yale Center for British Art. Uh, a great building also built at Yale. We saw the, the Yale Art Gallery. This was a, a, a newer work, so to speak. Uh, and uh, I, I like this work. I visited it and I, I like the fact that Khan was able to create a public institution. This is an institution. It is a museum, but it has the warmth uh, of a living room, uh, of a home because of the wood. Now, of course, you know, this is a large space and it is a public space. And there is the massivity uh, of, the, uh, of the concrete, but there is also the, the warmth of the wood. So it is a space that pendulates somehow between uh, pri privateness and, 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 and publicness, res publica and res privata. And uh, I, I think architecture in general, uh, uh, this is its task to negotiate between the two realms. It's a very good building. It, this is how it looks from the outside. You see that the, the roof is in a way not very different from what the ceiling at the, at the, the Yale Art Gallery uh, 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 showed us, uh, which is not far away from, it might even be this building here. I, I don't know, I didn't look in the site plan, but uh, this seems to be it. So again, interrelationships. In this case, between two buildings done by the, the same architect at a difference in time, um, you know, very, two different years, but the same architect and for the same uh, uh, university. Here again, we have the cylinder. We had it also at the, the art, uh, Yale Art Gallery, uh, but the, 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 the stair was uh, different, uh, uh, but, but it was enclosed within a cylinder. So this is the British Art Museum at the, the Yale, uh, Yale uh, University. Again, Khan was very attentive to light, to natural light as he was at Kimball, he understood that the value of light is, is, is very important uh, and, uh, for, a, for a museum. And uh, here again, just as uh, at the Exeter Library, the ceiling is, uh, has uh, evocative power. It is uh, sculptural, it is uh, even symbolically charged in a way, uh, and uh, it is impressive. Uh, at the same time, it is rather, rather simple. It's not as complex as at, at in Dhaka, for example, but will arrive there at the Parliament building. First Unitarian Church in Rochester, New York. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good building where the brick again shows its magic. 
that very brick that uh, Wright said that he could transform its weight uh, into a, into a, in, into a gold uh, weight. In other words, any brick for Wright would be its equivalent in gold because yes, brick is magical and, uh, and uh, all great architects used, used uh, with great uh, sensitivity uh, and understanding uh, brick. This is the plan um, of, of, of the church. What is interesting about this church, and I, I mentioned this in February as well, is that, you know, there is a cross here, but the cross is not a cross of light. The light is actually in, in, in the remaining spaces of the, of the square of the, of the ceiling. It's in the corners, the four corners. We see two of them here. And it's, it's a dark, uh, heavy cross, but maybe it's, uh, it's metaphor is uh, appropriate and, uh, and uh, um, probably uh, moving uh, for, for the one who enters this space. Are these people who take pictures here, architecture students, maybe. Anyway, um, also interestingly, this is not the first time. There is also at Exeter, I see a Persian rug on the floor, and I don't think this was provided in the, in the, in the, in the plan. For some reason, maybe people think that, and, but, but it's kind of interesting. You'll also see at Exeter a large, a large uh, uh, Persian rug uh, as it is called, uh, placed on the on the on the first floor, um, maybe some people think that his architecture is a little bit too cold. Maybe, um, but there is there is some kind of strange connection between the Islamic culture and the architecture of Louis Kahn. And no wonder he built in India. He built in uh, in uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, he even had a project for uh, Islamabad, for Pakistan. Um, yes, yes, he was a Jewish architect, but I think he transcended uh, the, 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 the fatal sometimes frontiers between religions and, 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 and the spirit of his work made possible, uh, you know, these uh, cultural conjunctions, you know, uh, an architect from the United States building in Bangladesh, building in Ahmedabad, building or wanting to build in Islamabad and so on. And, um, and here building a, a Christian church. Uh, yes, art should not have, uh, should not be uh, dominated by, or architecture shouldn't be dominated by uh, religious ideologies. No, no. Because I think great artists and great architects, and there is such a thing as a great artist and a great architect and a great writer and a great musician, they identify with, with that spirit we call sometimes God, we call sometimes Buddha, we call sometimes uh, Mohammed, we call sometimes maybe even uh, animistically a stone, I don't know, but uh, I am reluctant to accept an art or an architecture that is uh, uh, dominated uh, and described by a specific religion in obsessive terms. No. Uh, anyway, Olivetti, this is a new work I introduced in this presentation as opposed to the presentation in February. It is a factory, a factory for the famous Italian uh, uh, manufacturer Olivetti but it is in Pennsylvania, in Harrisburg. And it's an excellent building, you know, it's a fee factory, but it is architecture with a capital A. Yes, if this doesn't sound too rhetorical. Here again, I mean, look, you can take pictures of, of, of what is there and you wonder what it is. Is this some kind of an abstract uh, ornamental work or what is it? It's the, it's the roof of the building and uh, Khan was one of the architects who most explicitly uh, uh, um, had a quest for order. He even said, he asked himself, what is order? And he answered, order is, that's it. And you know, with this order is, he, he almost said God is. I mean, certain things shouldn't be doubted or questioned or, and so he was an, an architect for whom order in, a, in an almost uh, cosmic sense 
uh, was was extremely important. And uh, here my 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 expression is not quite correct because in Greek order means cosmos. So to say cosmic order is rather redundant because uh, because because order is cosmic by 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 its very essence and cosmos is also ordered by its very essence so yes in greek cosmos means order and order means cosmos they, they, there is an osmosis between the two uh, but uh, the structure is interesting and uh, and uh, it's just He's able, and I think this is true of most remarkable architectures and most remarkable architects, to make the structure ornamental and the ornament to make to become structural. In, in other words, there is beauty in the structure, a beauty that transcends the, 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 the specificities of structure per se. Now, I don't know if uh, Augustus Commandant worked for this project too, uh, I don't know, but it is, uh, uh, look at the plan, you know, I mean, uh, it's, 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 it uses modules, but it's not, uh, uh, I don't know what to say, it is static and it is also dynamic because of the rotations, because of these smaller rotated squares in between the, or these are squares and these are octagons. Uh, but uh, so the, the problematization of what is static uh, through through what is dynamic through the little diagonals creates this uh, tapestry, this uh, this woven structure that uh, that that is of a building that is of a building that is not uh, dogmatically uh, uh, frozen in its certitudes. And look at this; he does this sometimes, you know. I mean, I don't think this is a, a little room oriented towards Mecca. I don't think this building had anything to do with Islam. He does this sometimes. He, you know, really, I think, I think, I mean, I, I could avoid this, uh, this word because I, it's the second time I use it. But I think it is genius here in the corner. Who would make something like this, you know? I mean, maybe other architects would think of this, uh, you know, um, pavilion-like uh, large uh, factory with uh, modular structures and so on. But very rarely uh, an architect would, 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 in, would indulge in such a uh, idiosyncratic, uh, idiosyncratic little gesture in the corner, you know. Uh, but I like it. It's, 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 it's Louis Kahn, you know, it's, it, it shows a playfulness there, homo ludens. Very nice. I don't know the, what the function of that room is, though. Uh, maybe I'll find out by the 17th of March. Anyway, look at drawings, uh, engineering's drawings or architectural, but in this case, you cannot separate. You know, the, the, the engineering drawing is architectural and the architectural drawing is, is an engineering because there is a, a crossing of the border between one and the other. So there is beauty in engineering. And there's, there is rigor in, in the architecture. It's a good work for Olivetti. And Olivetti had a good uh, tradition in this sense, hiring great designers. And uh, he, the, even, uh, I think even Tadawando built something for uh, Olivetti in, 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 in Italy. Yes, the, 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 you know, look at the name of the engineer, August uh, Commandant, but you can tell you can tell that there the engineering is is excellent, and uh, yeah, that's what you get when you have a have a great architect and a great engineer working together. This is what you get, a good work. It's it's not a it's it's not a it's not a an emphatic work. And look, it has only one floor. It's flattish, but you can tell it's serious architecture. It's sensitive architecture. In other words, put it simply, it is architecture. It is architecture, yes. Exeter Library. What can we say? The quintessential library. I know of very few libraries in the world that, that have the power of this library, which is actually not so big. It is in the campus of a great university, the Exeter Library, uh, the Exeter University. Some critics comment on it that you, you don't quite know how to enter this building because it doesn't have a central, uh, you know, emphasized entrance. It's fine. Maybe in a way, 
it's it's a it's a metaphor for the difficulty to enter knowledge, right? Uh, there is no triumphal triumphal uh, entrance door into knowledge. There isn't. There is struggle. You know, you enter often through the back door. You know, you enter uh, sometimes through the through the basement, or it's difficult. You enter through darkness, longing for light. Uh, darkening darkness thus the gates of light as a poet said and i think uh, uh, somehow if you are honest this is how you enter knowledge with uh, difficulties maybe that's why i don't know exactly why he doesn't have the triumphal entrance uh, but uh, it's a it's, it's a good building it's a good building it's if you look at the famous interior, you would say, ah, this has something of the, you know, the ethos of, of uh, Boulet. Uh, but, but, but the building by right, by, by Louis Kahn is also modest. It's, it's, it's quite balanced. It is a balance between, uh, between uh, um, a certain idealism and also a certain sense of modesty. Because towards the outside, you just see regular, Know, more or less little windows. They are not so little. Here are the individual study places, you know, little tables with a chair uh, where you can individually study. And, and uh, the, the, the surprise is in the center, the big atrium. Uh, yeah, look at, the, look at the plan. We have, I have other pictures of this plan. So the, there are three layers in a way here. That's why he said it's like a ruin within a ruin within a ruin. Now, of course, the building is not ruined. Although if you look at the edges of these walls here, these piles here, uh, you know, it, it, it is as if the, because the corner is broken, you could say perhaps that, that it has something of a ruin. So there is, uh, there is here, uh, the space, the narrow space with individual uh, uh, tables for individual study. Then is the, the second uh, zone with the books, with the shelves. And then the central space, which is the void, which is dramatic and which symbolizes, I think, the quest for knowledge. Uh, this is the dramatic with a <laughs> Persian rag. I, rag. I don't know if it is Persian or not, but somehow I noticed the presence of these rugs in his buildings, and I don't think he intended them there. But there's nothing wrong with them, of course. Anyway, look upwards from the central space. Yes, this kind, the symbolism of this uh, this space uh, probably uh, would irritate or irritate it somewhat like Rem, Rem Kolchas, because it has an idealism here that Kolchas doesn't have. This is not a cynical place here. Yes, it might be. Some I think is a little bit rhetorical, or even some I think is demagogical. We should be more modest. But there is modesty here. After all, we are looking at letter X, the unknown. The unknown is right there above us. Now, we, we, we might call this unknown in a different way, but it is the unknown. It is the question mark. Let us not forget, Louis Kahn said, a question well asked is better than the most beautiful answer. So this is not an arrogant man, a man who understands the value of question. Now, of course, this is in the Talmudic tradition, but, but it also says something about a man who understands that like Socrates at the end of his life, we only know one thing that we don't know anything. So then the question becomes the challenging, uh, the challenging uh, uh, connecting element between the one who aspires towards knowledge and that that they aspire towards. So uh, I like this very much, this central space at Exeter Library. And it's, it's beautiful, doesn't matter how you look at it, in what conditions of light. Uh, you can speculate. You can you can uh, you can write quickly an ad hoc poem about what is here. You know the the books, the knowledge, the shelves, the the broken uh, concrete block because this mentally at least was a concrete block which he pierced with these large circles and then above, triumphant the question, the question mark, the X, the unknown. 
you, you see, it's a fortress in a way, you know, the, the, the culture is fragile. It has to be protected. We look at these walls, they are thick and they, they, they compress the space. And, and uh, it is a very interesting building. I think this man, I'm sure he loved books and I, I'm sure he loved knowledge. I'm sure he aspired, understood he had old books in his library. He, 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 this was a man who, who read, was a man immersed in history, but he was not a historicist and good for him that he was not. Uh, whatever we look at, any section or, or any plan of any floor, the drawings are all interconnected or interrelated. You cannot abstract anything, you cannot subtract anything, you cannot add anything. It is what it is. Uh, uh, but it's, it's one of the best libraries uh, ever built. It's monumental without actually being huge. I mean, there are much bigger libraries being built uh, today, but they don't have the inner monumentality of this building. Here we see the other building built by, by Khan, the dining room for the students at, at Exeter. So this is the library and this is the, the, the dining uh, room or dining space. We are going to look at it uh, as well. And look at the indi individual um, places for, for study, you know. It's something monastic here, you know, this, uh, he understood that if you learn best when you are somehow isolated. I mean, you, you belong to a community, to the collectiveness of your library. It's a, it's a library, it's a public library. But then you have your own little space where you could have the intimacy, where you could read in, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in your own solitude, so to speak. Yes, there is something a little bit monastic here. The dining hall at Exeter, uh, so this is the library and this is the dining hall, uh, larger in terms of its fruit, footprint. Um, also an uh, interesting work, you know, maybe a little bit too majestic, too monumental for a dining hall, but um, it depends how you look at it. I mean, maybe the act of eating is not or shouldn't be devoid of some kind of a spiritual dimension. I don't know, many people still make the sign of the cross in uh, Christianity before they start eating. Um, so you see here the dining hall and then behind uh, the Exeter library. Now, this makes me ad hoc uh, improvise, some, I mean, you know, makes me improvise something. I'm thinking the relationship between, because he talked about interrelatedness, you know, do we live in order to eat or we eat in order to live? I think we eat in order to live, although many people live in order to eat. In this case, when we look at these two buildings, maybe we ask the question, do we eat in order to then quest for knowledge or we quest for, we quest for knowledge in order to eat? What is the correct relationship? Uh, I think eating should be a medium towards something else. But when that something else is a medium for eating, I don't think is right. And we are obsessed by food these days, and we had been for, for many years, you know, this obsession with the menu, you know, with eating and eating and eating and countless kinds of food, you know, countless, you know. It shouldn't really matter so much what we eat, really. When we do when you do something that you love, you even don't know, you, you, you don't even know you are hungry. But when you have a boring life with a boring job at night, you rush to the refrigerator a few times to eat something because your soul is empty. That's why, not because the stomach is empty, but the soul, that's the problem. Anyway, the dining room by Louis Kahn. Uh, and uh, I don't know exactly what this is here. It's open, I think it has an open space in the middle, interesting. Um, well, you see, a creative architect, a very creative ar architect, invents everywhere. It doesn't matter where you look, you, you find surprising things. The Salk Institute at La Jolla in California, a great, uh, another great building. We already talked a little bit about that space between the two rows of buildings where Barbara Gunn advised him to not use vegetation. 
who was, uh, 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 I mean, uh, Mr. Salk. He was a man who invented the vaccine against poliomyelite. And then he got the funds to build the Salk Institute and he, hi and he hired uh, Louis Kahn. And from what I read, he only told him Kahn or Louis, I don't know how he called him, just do a building that would please Picasso. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Kahn tried and I think he succeeded. And uh, yeah, I repeat myself now because I said this in February too, but it seems, uh, well, Salk, the, the doctor who, 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 who created this campus um, married the third wife, I think, of Picasso after, after she divorced Picasso. So anyway, maybe the, this complex was not just for Picasso, but also for this woman. I, I don't know. It's, uh, but it's an interesting, uh, you know, uh, dialogue, so to speak, between the architecture and life and the accidents of life and the, you know, the anecdotes, anecdotes of life. Uh, it's, a, it's a famous space here because it is facing the Pacific Ocean and, uh, you know, people uh, love to be photographed here uh, when they get married. I don't think they like to be photographed here when they get divorced. And I think the sun sets here when uh, either the, I, 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 I plan to double check, but I forgot the equinox or the solstice, perhaps at the equinox, but one or the other. Uh, it seems that Khan uh, had this in mind or it was a coincidence. I don't know, uh, but it is a memorable space uh, clearly. And uh, the, the, the buildings are just, this dialogue between, uh, in this case, teak, this is the wood he used uh, for this part. So it's, it's concrete and teak, I mean, wood. And, uh, and uh, they open these spaces, the rooms of the scientists, they open towards the ocean, meaning towards the infinite. And, and uh, it's clearly an homage that the architect uh, uh, gave to, 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 to the ocean, to, to the sky, to, to light, to inspiration. And if we are to get exalted and carried away by maybe an old fashioned sensibility, we could add by God. Uh, again, Khan was an architect with spiritual concerns. Very few architects in modernity were like him, but he was. He talked about spirit. I, I, I repeat myself, and I, with the risk of being becoming boring, I will, I, will, I will recite the two lines from a poem he wrote in, as an introduction to the book or the exhibition by Boulet and Ledoux. Spirit in will to express can make the great sun seem small. The sun is thus the universe. Did we need Bach? Bach is thus music is. Did we need Boulet? Did we need Le Doux? Boulet is, Le Doux is, thus architecture is. So only an exalted spirit would write something like this. And he was exalted. And I think we need more of, of this, this kind of exalted architect. Uh, as Walter Gropius himself said in the manifesto, in the Bauhaus manifesto, the artist is a craftsman, is an exalted craftsman. He used the word exalted. He also was aware that the artist and he included the architect here had to have a craft, the knowledge of a craft. He ne needed to be a craftsperson, but that craftsperson had to be exalted in order to arrive at the level of art, at the level of architecture with a capital A. Now, maybe this emphasis uh, would have irritated or would irritate someone uh, with a state of mind of, uh, you know, of Rem Kolhas. Uh, so you see in the plans, so, you know, this, this space is open towards the Pacific Ocean. They emphatically so. It's a clear indication that the architects suggest, suggest to the scientist to to look through this window and, and be guided by this diagonal little wall towards the ocean. Because being here, you, you see inevitably the ocean and you see the sky 
and maybe you see the sunset. So in other words, you see the infinite because let us not forget. And again, I repeat uh, myself a little bit where I actually repeat what he said. A great building begins, begins with the unmeasurable or the immeasurable. Then it goes through the measurable. And then in the end, it comes back to the immeasurable or the unmeasurable. I forgot if he used the word unmeasurable or immeasurable, but it's really about the infinite. Now, only a man with spiritual concerns would, would, would say something like this. And you see clearly the, 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 the rooms of the scientists open towards the ocean, all of them. Uh, and uh, yes, some have some kind of oblongs or something, who knows, but, but, but the architect wanted all of them to pay homage to the ocean, to the infinite of the ocean, to the infinite of the sky, to the infinite of light. It's a, it, it's a magical uh, creation, I think. And of course, that the scene, uh, you know, uh, that this, this, this water that, that flows towards the ocean itself. Brynmore Dormitory in Pennsylvania, we, you saw some sex, um, sketches of the, of the plan of the building. Uh, this is a uh, dormitory for girls, it's a famous uh, college, uh, Bryn Mawr. And, uh, and uh, here we have again the Persian rug, this time uh, vertically exposed. Interesting, someone should, could write a paper or even a book, maybe Louis Kahn and the Persian rugs. Although it wasn't him who placed those rugs there, probably, most surely, but uh, they, 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 they showed up. Someone felt of it. And it's interesting why. And they're all kind of the same kind of rugs, probably very precious rugs. This one looks like a, you know, a genuine kind of rug. It's not vulgar. It's, it's, it's a beautiful, maybe uh, collectible uh, you know, uh, rug. Anyway, <clears throat> black stone uh, towards the exterior. And uh, again, the entrance through the corner, which is uh, um, almost typical for him. Not always that he does this, but sometimes he does. So a very strong uh, geometry you now, but the rotation, uh, the rotation uh, creates a dynamic configuration. So the building is not, uh, is not frozen into 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 is not paralyzed by a static geometry and there is geometry there is centrality but because of the diagonals the, the rotations becoming becoming joins being into a building that is both static and dynamic again something monastic there is this part there is this element in his work Kimball Museum, where he also worked with this, uh, uh, this excellent um, Estonian-American uh, engineer, commandant, Fort Worth, Texas. He employed here the ideology of the ruin, if I can call it so, again, because this, this part, this module, which is used also uh, for the length of the museum, is open as opposed to the others. In a way, it's like the, the open last uh, polyeder in the famous uh, sculpture by Konstantin Brunkush, the, the, the endless column, which is, which is cut in half. It is open. It represents the same aspiration uh, towards the unknown. This is a museum, but it's not a museum which says, I am done for good, and that's what it is. I'm a storage room for art, and I will never develop. I will not move forward. I will not grow. This part of the building, this I don't know how to call it, is evoking exactly that openness. It is an open-end street. It is, a, a, it is open-ended, the journey through culture, through art. And uh, this is what it's, it symbolizes. He could have arrested the building here, or he could have added another storage room here, just like the others. 
But no, he wanted just like the endless column, which is vertical, this is horizontal, he's evoking the same thing, the open, open uh, endedness of, 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 of any creative effort. And, uh, and, and the museum should be, after all, connected with what we call the creative effort. Great work, and also great work, the, the, again, how he, how he manages to, to bring natural light to the paintings on the walls. Uh, it's a fine detail. I hope I have here the, 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 some, some images with the detail. Otherwise, on the 17th of, February, of uh, March, I promise I will, uh, I will, uh, I will uh, include them in the presentation. And here, again, you can tell there was a great engineer. And they might have had some difficulties in their dialogue, but I'm sure it was, uh, they, were diff uh, they were fruitful um, difficulties. Uh, here you see some sophisticated, subtle things happening. I, I shouldn't even mention them because then I feel like talking at least half an hour about what I, what I see here. There are slight uh, th uh, certain things that you don't notice at first. Uh, deviations from the dogma because because truth is not dogmatic it shouldn't be dogmatic uh, even the working drawings are beautiful i love these working drawings you know they are technical drawings now uh, they are not about aesthetics and yet somehow there is beauty here i feel because you know why because order is as he himself said that order is is present here as well uh, and uh, an exhibition that took place at the Kimball Museum with the tower he did. Too bad, too bad, and too bad, and very unfair that the portrait of Van Ting is not shown. I, I, I am against this. You see, this is another case of injustice. The woman who inspired probably this tower and who had an important role in, in its design is not mentioned, is not present, as if this work was just his. And it's simply not true. You saw other images at the beginning where she is um, in the presence of this tower. She was one of the, of the co-authors, and yet she's not here. In as much as, as I, and I mentioned this before, and <laughs> sorry if I, someone heard, you, heard me saying this, when there was the retrospective of Vincent van Gogh at the Museum of Modern Art, at, at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, there was a huge flag with the name Vincent on it. But I should have, I would have placed also the name of Theo there, his brother, because without his brother, Vincent could, could not have painted, could not have died in order to, could not have eaten in order to paint. It was his brother, who sacrificed himself in order to provide Vincent with colors and some food, his name should have been on that flag. And the name of Aunt Ting should have been here on this wall. And she was not, and she is not, and this is not fair. Please take this from someone born in the Libra, uh, zodiacal sign under the Libra. I'm a Libra man, so to speak. I love justice, although not very often maybe I'm able to to find it, uh, but uh, I, 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 I love justice, yes. Uh, anyway, moving forward, I also love this, you know, I, you know the, the way he understood to, 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 to bring light, to, 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 how to say, to guide life, light uh, gently, the natural light to, to, to flow downwards uh, on the paintings hanging on the walls. Uh, and, and, and look here, the structure is not, you see that this dimension is different from this dimension. This one is narrower here, this one is larger. I don't know exactly why this happened, but it shows indeed that Khan was a meticulous architect and he worked, I'm sure, with a meticulous engineer, born also just like him in Estonia. It almost doesn't matter if those paintings are great, really, it doesn't matter. They look, I mean, the museum is so, is accommodating, is, is actually giving the tone, so to speak. The musicality of the architecture uh, welcomes almost anything, it, because the dignity of the building 
uh, brings dignity to almost anything. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know if a graffiti would have looked okay on that wall. Um, I don't know. Uh, Basquiat would have looked good, but probably yes. Anyway, Mondrian does look good here, and uh, who else is recognizable here? I don't recognize anyone else. But I love this picture, and look at this, uh, look at this man, you know, and his silhouette, his shadow. It's almost like an image of, I don't know, you know, the human being, his work, art, the sky, the water, the human destiny, the question marks on the ceiling of the Exeter Library. Uh, human life with its limits here and it's uh, an end with its inf infinity as well not just its limits uh, uh, here is a building by Renzo Piano so this is by Louis Kahn and this is by Renzo Piano uh, was a building built after Kahn built uh, his uh, yeah Dhaka Bangladesh I said this before and I say it again. How come that one of the poorest countries in the world, if not the poorest, as some described Bangladesh at that time, commissioned its the greatest maybe architect at that time in the world to build such an important complex of buildings that the United States didn't commission? How do you explain it? But maybe it's, it's some kind of a conjuncto oppositorum. Yes, poor means, meaning not not sufficient money, but great aspirations. Uh, a hospital, a hospital. I show this in February and I show it again on the 17th of March. Who would build such a um, uh, hospital, hospital today? Or who would have built like, uh, such a hospital uh, in, 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 in the past? I don't think too many people. Some might even think, come on, you know, this is a depressing hospital. I don't think it's, it is depressing at all. Uh, uh, and we see elements here of that uh, performing arts center that uh, that uh, in Fort Wayne uh, in uh, Indiana that that he built. But here we don't see a mask, but we see certain ele architectural elements that connect with other works by by Louis Kahn, especially what he did in uh, in Ahmedabad and here in Bangladesh. Uh, isn't it amazing? We are looking at the hospital, and hospitals very often do not have a very distinctive architecture. But this one is very much so. And again, we see this uh, open intermediate space between the inside and the outside. It's, it's, it's a welcoming space, it's a large space, it's a space that, that uh, I don't know, I, I'm imagining visiting this, this uh, hospital uh, and, and uh, uh, imagining that that the doctors there would try their best and uh, even if maybe they don't have the highest technology but but they have a building built by Louis Kahn and uh, look what it was in the proximity of this hospital by by uh, Louis Kahn architecture does have the power with silent means, in other words, without screaming itself, to to uh, uh, to send messages like these large, round openings, these large, huge, almost circles. What could their symbolism be? And look at this person who who is uh, fragile and who has a handicap, and then and, and she he or she he maybe exits the building or enters the building. But this large circle, this large opening into the world, maybe is, is, is telling uh, the one who suffers, you are welcome, you will be taken care of. And there are higher forces that will also participate in, 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 in trying to alleviate your suffering. Who knows? But architecture does have, I think, powers that, uh, that uh, shouldn't be uh, uh, undervalued. Government buildings at in Dhaka. Uh, what can we say? It's the most innovative governmental complex in the world. Well, of course, there is also the one in uh, Brasilia by Oscar Niemeyer. There is the one by Le Corbusier in Chandigarh. But we are all, we are taking talking in all three cases about um, important architects, architects who deserve their names to be named to be to I mean their names 
to be architects. Uh, it's so very different, no? Niemeyer, Kahn, Le Corbusier. All, all three of them handling or trying to respond to this theme, you know, a governmental campus. And the visions, very, very different. Now, the, you know, the, the one who loves cosmetics or, or uh, you know, uh, makeup and so on would protest, would say, no, no, we'll never accept something like this. Uh, certainly the, the ex-president of the United States would have said that this is, please don't allow me to, to say, use the word I wanted to use in his name. He would have said, this is not beautiful. This is ugly. This is unacceptable. This is, this, how could it be? The government building should be beautiful and classic, classical, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> what a falseness. There, there is truth here. This is not falseness. Uh, and uh, I like this truth, even if some people might think it's a brutalist uh, uh, kind of uh, truth. But isn't truth often uh, apparently brutal? Um, anyway. And look at this, you know, the magnificent of, of our magnificence of architecture and it's just, you know, the, supporting the architecture, you know, is at the bottom, but it's splendid. It's, uh, it's, you know, as an architect, you know, I would, I would gladly sleep here in one of these alcoves, you know, I would, I would, I, I, it wouldn't matter to me that there is, there isn't something soft here, you know, some kind of, you know, uh, great mattress. Anyway, what is architecture? And this is the, 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 the main building, so to speak, and it stands out because it's the, the, the gathering place is where the assembly hall is, is, uh, is, is the most important uh, governmental building in Dakar. And uh, I said this before, and I say, I'll say it again. I read that uh, when there was war between Pakistan and Bangladesh, the pilots, the bombers from Pakistan flew over this building and they didn't bomb it because it's, they thought it was already bombed. Because it's true, Louis Kahn didn't find the solution for covering the central space, so it was open. But I think it's more than that because much of his architecture does have an intrinsic and sometimes explicit or extrinsic uh, connection with what a ruin is. The assembly hall building is this one, and uh, yes, it was the luck of fate that uh, that uh, made those uh, Pakistanis bombers not bomb this building, because they thought it was already bombed. It would have been a tragedy. How could you bomb such, such a beauty? I mean, look at this. I mean, how pathetic our uh, usual governmental buildings are compared to this building, really. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yes, he could be accused sometimes of formalistic, uh, certain formalism. It's true. It's it's maybe not entirely illegitimate to see here and there gestures towards formalism. But all in all, you also see a quest for a meaningful architecture, symbolic architecture, an architecture that would identify a country, and it did. I, I saw an architect, an important architect from Bangladesh in a, an interview with him in the proximity of this building with tears in his eyes when he mentioned Khan. Khan was indeed a guru for them. You know, it, it, it brought a, a, another level of the cultural discourse through his buildings. It offered to Dhaka something that maybe Dhaka needed. And, uh, and, uh, it's even possible that, that he didn't make a lot of money, if at all. In fact, uh, a friend of ours on Zoom, uh, the architect from Ahmedabad, India, Vatsal, no, no, it wasn't him, sorry. I, 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 I watched a video with Doshi, the first Indian architect who received the Pritzker Prize, and he said that Khan worked in Ahmedabad without pay. Well, there, he was not a businessman. Louis Kahn was not a businessman. He was an architect and an, an artist who deserved to be called an architect or an artist. He was not a businessman. That's why he was bankrupt when he uh, ended his life. And where was the house of Louis Kahn? Nobody knows. He didn't have his own estate, 
you know, he didn't have uh, villas and so on. We don't know. I don't know where he lived. Maybe he lived in a little apartment with his wife and his daughter. I don't know. But this man created this, uh, you know, uh, impressive complex in, in, in Dhaka. And you see here, this is the mosque and a little bit uh, not on the axis of the building. And it's, it's one of the greatest mosques uh, I, I, I saw either in books or uh, otherwise. We'll take a look at it. Uh, so he struggled towards the roof, but in the end he found it. Look at this. He, di he didn't arrive. Two years took him. Uh, he, it took him two years to, to arrive at the, at the right uh, configuration of covering the central space, the assembly hall itself. Uh, in the end, he found it. And it's it's. It's 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 no more no less. You it's it's almost as if it cannot be any other way but this way. Uh, yes. This is the mosque. Uh, and uh, we saw the Rochester uh, Church, uh, and we look at the mosque. There, he, he kind of had a similar theme in a way, the light coming from the corners. But there you had a cross on the ceiling. Here you have this rotated square. Very interesting. Maybe one day uh, someone could write a paper about comparing this mosque with a church, with a church in Rochester. Two, two religions, but one God. After all, Islam, and the Jewish uh, spirituality and the Christian spirituality, they all come from the same, from Abraham, Ibrahim, Avram. They come from the same root. Why do they fight each other like crazy? I, I will never understand. They are all good relatives, actually. They are uh, one family. Uh, anyway, look at the mosque. I don't think any any Christian or any whatever the religion would not feel here the presence of something higher. I don't know how to call that something or someone higher, but but beauty transcends the specificities of uh, so-called specialized religions. This is for all. Uh, you know, uh, what else can I say? And so is the whole building somehow. Now, the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad, India, uh, which was on the, on the verge of being demolished, but it, it, it was not demolished, thanks God, and uh, it was saved because the architects protested, the community of architect, ar architects protested, and they saved it. And here again, there is, if there is a, a war that is almost unavoidably connected uh, with, with, with Khan, is hero heroism. This is a heroic architecture. And it is an architecture that combines, as I said, the light of a candle with a laser light. So it, 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 it has a gesture of, uh, you know, sophistication and emancipation through forward looking um, activities, but also it looks towards the past and also it has a sympathy, it, I feel, uh, compassion even, and empathy towards those underprivileged. This is an architecture that does not say, I am an aristocrat and you are nobody. No, it is an architecture who, who says, I am for everyone and we are all equal. And there is greatness in everyone and there is uh, also the human dimension, which is not immeasurable. but. But in the, within the limits of the human dimensions, it's possible a lot, I think. And, and so his architecture is both heroic and modest, I think. Unadorned brick. Of course, it has to be unadorned because just as uh, the, the very interesting in, uh, British architect who lived and worked in India, Laurie Baker said, you know, uh, brick should be unadorned, should not be uh, hidden uh, beneath plaster. 
And look at these buildings. You would say, are they on Mars or on Moon or we have the sky is too blue, too light. Uh, there is sunlight here. No, we, but but the buildings are archaic. They they are archetypal. They are they are powerful. They are mysterious. You don't know what they are. I mean, this is a dormitory for students for the Institute of Management. I find them uh, indeed. Uh, maybe maybe you would say, come on, you know, you cannot build such buildings for uh, an Institute of Management. I don't know. Why not? Uh, and the beauty of brick. What else can you say? The humble brick. And you'll see some great black and white pictures. I discovered a photographer who took very nice pictures like this one. This is the power of architecture. That's all I can say. What else can, what else can I say? Or this one. Yes, the pedantic uh, one would say, no, 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 no. This is ugly. This is imperfect. This is, no, it's not. The spirit is, is, is there and it is strong and it is uplifting. That's how I see it. And this is, uh, these are some, uh, some, this is the plan actually of, of this particular uh, section of, of the campus because it's a large, it's a large campus. Uh, I like this, this picture, you know, it's so typical of Khan, you know, he uses rectangular uh, structures, rectangular buildings, and then he betrays them with these diagonals that sometimes create uh, uh, very unexpected uh, uh, views and quite powerful, I would say. Now, we end the presentation uh, with a few private houses uh, and uh, a few unbuilt works. The Fisher House in Pennsylvania, uh, a, a very nice uh, house where, again, he is able to create a, an architecture of interrelatedness because this building is placed in nature and the walls communicate with the trees. They have, tree, they, they have wood on the walls. It's the geometry of man, but using a material which communicates with uh, its uh, brothers and sisters, so to speak, the bushes and, 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 and the trees around it. And there is also stone. And there is, again, the geometry of man but, but this geometry, I don't think is arrogant, although it's, it is distinct from what nature is, is a fine building. They are boxes, no? They, you, very easily, he could have been a rationalist using some boxes. But no, I mean, even though here they are opaque, uh, you know, there are some windows here and there, but they don't emanate that feeling of being a box, an enclosed box, you know, a, a frozen box. And this corner, I commented on it before, is magnificent, where the furniture becomes part of the frame of the windows in the corner. So there is this ambiguity, you know, between uh, you have the corner of the room and you also have the furniture and, and they become one, uh, sculpturally so as well. Not bad, not bad at all. And I think if you put a, a few pillows there, uh, you might enjoy very much sitting on that bench near the window and also have who knows what in this little cabinet or very, very interesting corner. Also close to the, you know, to the heart, to the chimney here, you know, to you can uh, there are here certain things that need to be further studied. Um, I, Khan was a, was a serious architect, so he doesn't have frivolous uh, gestures in, in his works. The Asherick House, uh, an early work by him, one of the earliest, 1950 something. Uh, I think the Fisher House was also from the 50s, maybe towards the end of 1950s. This is a little different from the Fisher House, uh, the Escherich House. Uh, I'm sure Mario Botta found some inspirations here, uh, but but Khan uh, goes beyond, uh, you know, predictability, a predictability of a system. Um, 
would we say that this work is new, is old, is well? Yes, it belongs to the 20th century, but also it has something that somehow connects with something older or something not yet uh, arrived, uh, not yet, uh, not yet here. Uh, he is able here to bring in an architecture that that uh, uh, that uh, confuses one in a way because it is about the a historical or the unhistorical. I try to avoid the word eternal. The Shapiro residence, this is the third and last uh, residence that I show. Uh, this one, I only found two or three pictures. Um, it's still by Louis Kahn. Uh, and here we see some references to some early work that we saw both at the Trenton and that house that was all looked like a, a being abandoned. Uh, and. Uh, this is the last picture with, uh, with uh, the private houses. And now uh, a work in, uh, in New York City, the ancient temple pressing the four, uh, uh, let me read, uh, built four decades after Louis Kahn's death, the New York City's Four Freedoms Park. This was built, but after his, his death, 40 years after his death, the architect's posthumous memorial to Franklin D. Roosevelt and his palaces is becoming one of the architect's most popular urban spaces. In a recent article for The Guardian, this person investigates what he describes as perhaps Khan's best project. I don't know about that. Wainwright's spatial description of the monument is interweaved by fragments of Khan's personal history, building up a picture of a space with the feel of an ancient temple precinct and a finally nuanced landscape. Although Gina Polara, who ultimately realized the, uh, realized the plans in 2005, argues that Four Freedoms Park stands as a memorial, not only to, to uh, Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal, but to Khan himself. Can a posthumous project ever be considered as an architect's best? This person, uh, James uh, Foster, wrote this. Uh, so this was built 40 years, 40 years, 40 after his death uh, on uh, Roosevelt Island. And uh, I didn't visit it. I don't know what you feel when you are there. Uh, this is a drawing done by Khan. And this is what, this is how it looks like now. So it was built in uh, not too many years ago. Uh, he died in 73. So we had 40 years. That is 2014. So six years, seven years ago. Here is the United Nations building. Uh, yes, an interesting urban space. But so these new shots, I'll show some new shots by of this photographer, documents the Freedom Spark by Khan, which opened to the public well in 2012, almost 40 years after it was death, after his death. And there is the portrait of Roosevelt. And uh, uh, it's hard to tell from the pictures, but uh, it is a work that was, was built after his plans, after he died. Actually, uh, Dan, I have visited it and it is, it is a wonderful place to be. And it's not just the architecture, but also the trees that make it wonderful. And the trees are uh, probably more, uh, I mean, they grew up a little now. Uh, Yes, it was very lush when, when I went there and uh, the space between the trees was completely shaded. So what did you feel, Mahadev? It was like uh, you, you felt the, the silence of spirit, the, the peace? Yes, peaceful. peaceful. It would have been a, a wonderful place to meditate, for example. Yes, you know, by the way of this Mahadev, maybe you can mm. help. I had this idea. And I even wrote the text, and I would uh, I would discuss it with anyone. You know, there is that island, uh, the island of the dead, in a way, uh, in in the Bronx, where the people who died because of the pandemic are mm. are, are buried. Uh, I forgot how it is called. Um, it has a name, this island. So I, I thought of creating something like this to launch a competition, because I think that 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 island should should not be just. Uh, you know, this place where we discard some dead bodies, but 
but a place which actually announces kind of a new life, just like this this space, from what you right. said, and I'm glad that you 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 have this intervention, is 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 a, is, is actually not the space of an ending, but the space of a beginning. From right, what or a space of uh, new possibilities. Yes, new possibilities. Yes, and uh, we'll, we'll talk um, with another occasion. Now I'm also a little bit tired, and I want to end this presentation. But something must be done about, uh, uh, you know, the impact of the pandemic and the relevance of that space. And I want it to be relevant, as if, as if it it, it is uh, from there. From the tragedy that it that that it houses, that it, it, it you know it's a place where the, the people who didn't have other 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 you know, other graves they, they they were buried they sometimes in a you know collectively anyway uh, I'm afraid now I cannot explain very well but somehow this project by Khan makes me think of makes me think of that anyway. Um, I'm glad that you said uh, this, uh, Mahadev, about this. You visited it, and uh, maybe uh, on the 17th of, uh, of March, you can uh, maybe, if you want, you can tell us more about your experience here. Uh, yes, it's a space of meditation in a city which, uh, you know, doesn't truly have uh, too many spaces destined for. Uh, for meditation, you know, Vita Contemplativa is not what New York City is famous for. But but this space seems to be indeed, and that's because Khan, you see, even 40 years, almost 40 years after his death, he continues to, 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 to advance uh, a different kind of architecture, an architecture that does not neglect spirit or contemplation new possibilities, uh, unbuilt works. And with this, I will end. I'll show three, two or three works that were unbuilt. And uh, uh, there is a book, which I actually had. I don't know if I still have the unbuilt masterworks. And some people uh, created virtual uh, images of these buildings. So they build them virtually, if otherwise they were not be built. They were not built. The Palazzo dei Congressi, the palace of, uh, uh, you know, congresses, if, uh, congresses, is there such a word in English? I understand, Palazzo dei Congressi in Venice, in Italy. Um, well, you know, the model looks a little bit monolithic and huge, and I don't know exactly where it would have been placed on the map of Venice, but it was done for Venice. And uh, unfortunately, this site plan is not very clear. Uh, the image is not very good. Hopefully, I can I can elaborate on it a little for, uh, more uh, uh, for the on the 17th of March. Some sketches uh, of the architect for for it, uh, the plan, uh, quite a large building, um, and uh, you know Venice is Venice, so uh, I don't know. It depends where it, it it was to be placed, but it was not built. But he was highly valued in Venice because his friend Carlo Scarpa lived and worked in, I don't know if Scarpa lived in Venice, but he, he, he was a professor at the, the University of Architecture in Venice. Although strangely, Scarpa was not teaching architecture, but uh, interior architecture. Although, of course, interior architecture is also architecture, so we shouldn't really differentiate between them. But he was teaching interior architecture because he didn't have an architect diploma. <laughs> there were some problems with Scarpa. Uh, he didn't get the diploma. We are talking about almost the equal of Khan, maybe without almost. They were, in my opinion, at that, that time, the two greatest architects in the world, Khan and Scarpa. And uh, it's nice to, to read that they were friends. So this is the Palace of Congress or Congress is now the Hurva uh, Synagogue in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and this would have been a great building, but was not built. But maybe one day they will build, uh, build it when, uh, when uh, Israel will make peace with Palestine. Why not? Maybe they will bring it, they will build it together. Of course, this is a dream, but what, why shouldn't we dream? Uh, it, 
what can we say? Uh, yeah, we look at these images and it's nice that someone thought of build, so-called building it virtually, but it's not the same thing. It's not, it's, it's, we saw the built works and we see these renderings and they are not quite the same thing, despite the good intentions. Uh, and in fact, there is more life, I think, in the sketch by Khan than in the renderings done with a very sophisticated technology. But yes, the drawing was done by Khan himself. And it was an important project for him, of course. It has something similar in a way with the Exeter Library. You know, you remember the Exeter Library plan. Not built. Uh, this is the case in the lives and works of any architect. Not all projects are built. And sometimes the works that are not built uh, are equally relevant because they uh, express uh, ideas that uh, some of the built works didn't. The memorial to the six million Jewish martyrs in New York, which was also not built. Um, and uh, there were these cubes, you see six with that uh, interior cell. Uh, here we see more than six. I don't know exactly what is going on, but Anyway, it is. Uh, it was a project that he worked on with a lot of interest, but uh, it was not built. But look at the drawing. The, the kind of lyricism that this drawing has, very few architects today can produce. I, it hurts me to, to say it, but I think it's true. Um, and uh, the trees that, uh, that bring in shade, uh, and uh, the shade of the trees is needed and not just the shade, but the trees themselves because they give us oxygen and we need that oxygen badly and they give us oxygen for free. It doesn't cost anything. We don't have to pay the trees any honorarium in order to get oxygen for them. We just don't have, we just have to protect them, not to cut them down, uh, which we, we, we continue to do, unfortunately. Uh, and another sketch of this memorial. And this is, I think, the last images of this rather long presentation. Uh, I'm a little bit tired and maybe you felt this from, from my words. So I thank you very much. And let's wish a uh, happy birthday to Louis Kahn.